Hey Genesis, my name is Taylor and wherever you are joining us from today, we just wanna say welcome. We are so glad that you're here. If this is your first time, we are so honored that you would take time out of your day to be with us. If you are new or if this is your first time joining us, we would love to connect with you. You'll notice a button popping up below and that will take you right to our digital connect card. If you fill that card out, we will feed a family of five on your behalf through our partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank. And if you sow into the kingdom of God through Genesis Church, we just wanna say thank you so much for your continued faithfulness in this season. If you are ready to give today, you can text the word Genesis Give to 97,000, or you can click the button popping up below that says give. Here is what today is gonna look like. We are going to worship God through song. We're gonna lean in and listen to a word from our pastor today. And at the end, you'll have an opportunity to follow Jesus for the first time or for the first time again. But right now, let's lean in to the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's worship God together as a family, Genesis Church. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Men's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. See 
the altars where you meet us. Take me there, take me there. If what you need is just an offering, it's right here. My life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I wanna be consumed. I wanna be tried by fire. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I wanna be tried by fire. Purify. You take whatever.
well, well, Genesis at home. Hey, we're real glad you're here. Hey, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Josh, and I get to pastor this church with my wife, Carly. Genesis Church, you are here because you got a text invite or a social media invite, or you're part of the family, and uh, we are really glad you're here. If you're here for the first time, next time you show up, you family, dog, we adopted you, you get no choice. That's just the way we roll. Uh, we have a few uh, socially distanced, a, a small contingent here in the room as we are working toward re-entry. And uh, it's good just worshiping, worshiping in this room, praying in this room. We're praying for you, believing that you're going to be encouraged here today. Maybe you're joining us um, and you would say, hey, man, I wouldn't consider myself somebody that follows Jesus. I pray that you see Jesus today in a way that is so beautiful and so compelling that as we are sharing here today, that you're like, man, I need, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Maybe, maybe you're joining us and you've been walking with God for 30 years. And I pray that you see Jesus in a brand new light, that there's a new love, there's a new fire, that the Holy Spirit grabs your heart again today. You're like, man preacher that sounds really hyperbolic but we just believe that kind of stuff around here that God is continually reaching and filling and 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 coming after you pursuing you in Jesus name we you have joined us for a fun Sunday every Sunday is fun this uh format is going to be a little different um, because I get to interview a couple of the missionaries that we support from this church and we're going to hear stories from them and what I don't want you to do is maybe disqualify yourself on the front end when they start talking about mission work and being like, oh, man, I don't know if I'm called to be a missionary. Uh, we have already done this one time at 9 a.m. I keep pointing. You can't see them. I don't know why I'm pointing. Uh, that we've already done this once at 9 a.m., and it was they dropped some pure gold. And so if you are listening with ears to hear and you have come with expectant hearts, Holy Spirit, speak to me today, then you are going to walk away more in love with Jesus. You're going to walk away with some handles. And here's also what we're praying and believing, that some people are going to feel the call into the mission field through hearing these stories in Jesus' name. So I'm going to invite um, Derek and Tammy Walker to come up and join us. Can we show them some love in the room in Genesis at home? Why don't you drop in the chat? Why don't you drop welcome in the chat? Go ahead and drop that in there. I love seeing these. We got our chat rolling. Hey, Patty and Wit and Rochelle and Tia. So glad that all of you guys are joining us here online. Derek and Tammy Walker. Hi. Hey. How great. are you? We are great. Great to be with you today. <laughs> you know, awkward interview, guys. So, <laughs> hey, um, uh, We've called this uh, conversation today the power of the pivot. And if you're taking notes, you can write that down, power of the pivot. Somebody can drop it in the chat, power of the pivot. And part of what I have learned and, and come to love about your ministry is the pivots that you guys have gone through. And the reason I wanted to frame it up that way is uh, because there are a lot of us in this season right now who've been forced to pivot. Like we preached a message last weekend called, it wasn't supposed to be like this. And like when you planned your family and you planned your future and you picked your major and you took that new career, like you didn't see any of this coming. Like it wasn't supposed to be like this. 2020 was not on your horizon. It wasn't on the radar. And I have come to love and appreciate your ability and your, what your life has been marked by um, some pretty powerful pivots. And so what I'm praying is that if you find yourself in a season of pivot or a season of uncertainty that that the wisdom that we're going to hear from Derek and Tammy today can encourage you and, and that you would leave here uh, with, with a measure of confidence, knowing that God is in every single pivot. Let's, let's remember uh, that it wasn't supposed to be like this, but God saw this. Like even though you didn't see this, God saw this. And I know it wasn't supposed to be like this, but God is even in this. In Jesus' name. Okay, I'm going to ask you some questions, and it's going to be fun. And uh, you guys maybe tell some jokes. I don't know. Okay, you guys have learned to pivot. You pastored your church um, in Arkansas, and, and then you sensed the Holy Spirit calling you into the mission field. And we have a lot of people, like I said, in seasons of uh, transition, contemplating next steps, contemplating future. What do I want to orient my life around? So what did you guys learn about obedience and waiting on God and, and how did you discern that the mission field wasn't just like a passing idea, but it was actually the voice of God speaking into the next seasons, uh, into the next season of your lives? 
Well, thank you for having us today. It's yes. awesome to be here with you. And we're just grateful to be in this room with all of you. And honestly, I, I just so excited because you've been partners with us for years now. Yeah. And we do have some, the privilege of being a part of some pretty amazing stories. And we just want to encourage you this morning that these are really your stories today. Amen. And so anything that we might get to say, you're already a part of it. Amen. And so uh, thank you. Uh, well, several years ago, uh, we were uh, together since the call of God in our life to serve in missions. Yeah. And it was a prophetic word over our life, and we believed that was the truth. Uh, at that time, we were youth pastors. And we continued doing what we were doing at that time in youth ministry. And as things go, doors didn't open to leave. Although we went on several missions trips uh, to different countries, I went thinking each time, is this it? Or this may be it. And I never felt like wow, this wow, was wow. it. And so I came home, and we went back to doing what we were doing. Next thing you know, we're assistant pastors at another church, and then we're lead pastors at a church, and then we're lead pastors at another church. Wow. And literally, and this is the cool thing, I was thinking I was never going to leave that church. In fact, the cemetery in town, I have walked through it thinking, this is where I'll end, because <laughs> I was never leaving. And then an opportunity came, uh, even with a prophetic word, and wondering yeah. if we would ever serve in mission the way that I thought it should be done or thought it would be done, thinking maybe it was going to be different than I thought. I went on a trip to Africa, and there God absolutely got a hold of me in such a way that it was not just spiritual, but it was physical. Wow. I mean, he so arrested me and got a hold of me that uh, I knew something was coming from this. Yeah. Well, there was an opportunity there to financially partner with the people that we were with, and so I wrote off all those feelings as being connected to that, mm -hmm. and we gave, and we did, and, and, and I thought, okay, that was it. But then several months later, a strategic leader from Africa over the continent called and asked me a question. And he phrased it like this. He said, Derek, do you love missions or are you literally called to serve wow. in missions? And in that moment, uh, kind of like your life flashing before your eyes, I, I just like slowed down and I, and I thought, oh my goodness, what I say next really wow. matters. Wow. It's important. Wow. And I thought for a second, and then I said, many years ago, we had a call in our life to serve in mission, and you're calling me on the phone, and you're asking me, am I interested? I said, yes, I'm interested. And he said, I think we need to talk. Two days later, we were in Missouri, another state, and, and visiting with him and talking to him about our next steps and what that would look like. And so we absolutely pursued that. Well, I, I hope what you heard there, um, and, I, and I love this, is that you guys felt the call to missions way before you ever stepped into the, the fruition of what you felt was a calling on your life. Like, you felt the call, and then, like, what I hope you're hearing, and, and tell me if I'm saying this wrong, is that they, you just kept saying yes to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like, even though you felt like, like, uh, like youth pastor and assistant pastor and then lead pastor and then lead pastor again was like, God, what about this call? God, what about this? But you just kept saying yes to Jesus until, like, it got to the point to where you said earlier, I think you, if, and correct me if I'm misquoting you, um, but that you told them, we are not the right people for this. We're too old. Yeah, that was my question. I said, look at us. I mean, we're not young. We're not the age of most people who go. Are we too old? Yeah. And he said, sit down. You are exactly what we need. Yes. Because the situation that we found ourselves in didn't exist years before, wow. for one thing. And we didn't have the life experiences that were needed. We didn't have the pastoral experience. Brilliant. We didn't have uh, any of the qualities or, 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 or things that they were looking for at that time, earlier time in our life. And they said, you are exactly yeah. what we need today yeah. on the field. And I, and I literally, to that, I just said, we can't close this door. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So... Hear, hear what he said, that he wasn't ready for it and it wasn't ready for him yet. Like, and I think we can get really, 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 really impatient with a word that we know God told us. But, but you weren't ready for it yet. Like you said, you hadn't had the life experience. You hadn't had the ministerial experience. So if you would have just jumped out and gone, you would have got way ahead. You could have got crushed. Like this opportunity didn't exist. And so God like just saying, hey, how about 
How about youth pastor? How about assistant pastor? How about lead pastor? Hey, how about lead pastor again somewhere else? Hey, go walk in that cemetery and pray that you get buried here. <laughs> Just to make sure. It's like taking Isaac, put Isaac on that altar, you know? Like, nope, this is it. This is where I'm going to be. And then God's like, bam, okay. You're ready for it. It's ready for you. Hey, so if you, if you are like, you're, you're trying to pivot and you feel like you got something in your heart and God has put something in your heart, let's just remember, keep saying yes to Jesus. Right. When the door is open, when the time comes, it will be there. You will know. The, the second question I want to ask Tammy, and we'll get to in a second, is how, how did you know that it was the voice of God and it wasn't just like an idea that you had? Like how, how could you tell that it was actually God speaking into this next season of your life? Because if you just have a good idea and jump out ahead, like you can get in trouble. But it wasn't ready for you. You weren't ready for it. And there's some things that, are, that you're not ready for yet. Doesn't mean that God didn't speak them, but you ain't ready. So be faithful where you are, and God is, he's, he is, uh, to use Christine Kane's words, he's preparing you for what he has prepared for you. Like, you're not ready for it, it ain't ready for you, just keep saying yes to Jesus and slow your roll, homes. Okay, okay. So how, how could you discern that, that when that moment came, it wasn't just like an idea, but it, w it was the voice of God speaking into the next season of your lives together, because I think there's a lot of people who are like, was it God? Does he talk? How do, like, uh, how could you discern? Give us some practical ways that you were like, this is God speaking into this next season of our life. Um, I think one of the things first is that you always have to passionately pursue God. To hear the voice of God, you need to be passionately pursuing him. And so when we were given that prophecy, that is basically what our pastor told us. He says, you never pursue a prophecy. Brilliant. You continue to pursue God just like you did the day Brilliant. before, just like you will Brilliant. tomorrow. And when you passionately pursue God and you make your plans, God directs your footsteps. Brilliant. Then, you know, a lot of people ask me when Derek came into the kitchen and said, we're going to Africa, you know, what did you have to process? And, <laughs> and you know, what emotions did you feel? And I said, wow, I wish I could tell you some really intense story. But it was like, Okay, it's, it's time. Mm. That, that this, it was God because he had been working on it. But I believe the key is this. You have to passionately pursue wow. God. I mean, you got to stick tight with God. I love that. You don't, you don't pursue the word. You pursue Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that is, that's that's going to be helpful. That's going to let some of y'all off the hook. Some of y'all are tripping. That's going to let you off the hook right there. You just keep pursuing Jesus. I love what you said. Like you did yesterday and like you're going to do tomorrow. Yeah. Exactly. Makes you think of Jesus where he's like, don't... Why are you worrying about tomorrow? Like, today's got enough of its own trouble. <laughs> like, you just worry about today. That's brilliant. I love it. Okay, it, here's, here's a fun question. Okay, I want you to think about, well, I think it's fun. Maybe you don't. But uh, uh, think about 20-year-old Derek and 20-year-old Tammy. And I want you to help, help me get into 20-year-old Derek's brain. Like, where is he sitting? Maybe it's a cafe. Maybe he's sipping some coffee. But 20-year-old Derek in you found keys to a time machine outside. You were like going for a stroll and you found him and you could go visit him. And you get to give him the rules to the time machine. You get to give him one like encouragement, one piece of advice, one piece of wisdom from scripture. What do you say to 20 year old Derek? I would first say you did really awesome at picking a wife. Hey! <laughs> You're gonna get some smooches later for that one. Well played. All right. <laughs> but aside from that, <laughs> I, I would have to say that uh, to be intentional in the moment that you're in, be intentional with the circumstances, be intentional, uh -huh. be more intentional with, with everything that happens in your life, the mm -hmm. relationships that you have, the people that you meet, the teachings that you hear, the situations that you're in. Use every one of those uh, to make yourself better, to make your, your family better, to make everything better. Mm -hmm. Be intentional with the message that you hear. Be intentional with, with uh, the direction that you're going. I just feel like uh, I, I could be so much more, in, could have possibly been probably so, so much more intentional in so many situations when mm -hmm. I look back uh, with people and friendships and valuing uh, circumstances and valuing people mm. that were in my life. Mm. And so, uh, you know, to be present in that and to be intentional in those moments. Okay, I'm going to change the rules again. I forgot how to do this last time. That 20-year-old Derek, I'm going to pretend I'm 20-year-old Derek, and I get to go, but wait, Derek, what about? And I get to ask you a question, and then you can respond to me. So I change the rules again because I have the microphone and I'm the pastor and I can do that. So the question from 20-year-old Derek, my pushback is, that's awesome. I think I'm already intentional in everything that I do. Like, I don't just flippantly, like, I think I'm pretty intentional 
50-year-old 50, 50 handsome Derek, how are you so handsome? Secondly, <laughs> what do you mean? Because I think that I'm intentional. So what do you mean be more intentional? Help me understand in my 20-year-old brain. We fall prey to deception pretty easily. And, you know, we go along life a lot of times thinking we're right and others are wrong. Mm. We've got it figured out. Nobody else does. If only everyone could be like me, wouldn't this be an awesome place? <laughs> yes, it would. Thank you. Finally. <laughs> telling you. Someone understands. But, you know, there's hardships that you're going to face. There's difficult situations that you're not going to see any redeeming quality or purpose in. Wow. And God uses all of that. Wow. God uses the difficult. God uses the hurt. God uses Thank the you, pain. Jesus. He doesn't waste those circumstances. You don't experience them for nothing. Mm. And they're there coming. And they're going to happen. And you're not going to enjoy those. But don't waste those moments either. Mm. Uh, and use them for some good. Let God wow. redeem those things for yeah. greatness. So if I'm hearing what you're saying, like, to be intentional is, like, there is no, like, th there's no throwaway moments. Like, right. something you said that, was, that just caught me is, like, even the things that, like, cause so much pain and confusion, you don't understand. Like, God is, God is going to use those to shape you and propel you. And so, so maybe intentional, if I'm, I don't want to hijack your message, but intentional could be, like, regardless of what I'm experiencing in any season, any circumstance, God, I know that you're in control. We got a lot of people pivoting right now. God, I know that you are in charge. You are on the throne and you are going to use this. Did 20 year old Derek repeat that back to you properly? <laughs> he did. Wow. <laughs> he did good. He's so smart. Okay. Tammy, 20 year old Tammy. Cause we got, the reason I'm asking this question, we got a lot of um, people, you know, 20 to 30 in our church who are navigating new seasons of life, navigating kids, navigating marriage for the first time, navigating buying homes, uh, navigating choosing careers. And then we have a global pandemic and an economic downturn and, and racial unrest in the streets. And it's like every, everything's burning and it's on fire. And it's like, it wasn't supposed to be like this. So maybe help me because I can understand 20 year old Derek a little more because I was a 20 year old man at one point. Help me understand what's on 20-year-old Tammy's heart. What's in her mind? What is she thinking about? And then, same question. If you had the time machine and you go back and you could just encourage, you could sit there face-to-face, -face, sipping some coffee with 20-year-old Tammy, and you get to tell her one thing, what do you encourage her heart with? Uh, well, just to age me, I was raised in the 60s. So when I got out of high school, it was I can do anything I want. I mean, mm. that was the pursuit. I was a woman. I can go to college, I can get a career, no matter what I put my mind to, I will be mm. able to accomplish. Mm. And I, I can have everything. I can mm. have a job, I can have a career, I can have a family, I can, I mean, mm. I can do a whole lot of mm. stuff. And now that I look back during that time in my life, what if I could go back and tell myself something, I would tell myself, depend on God more. Mm. Passionately pursue God more. <laughs> Because I can do a lot of things. Yeah. You can do a lot of things. We have this potential God put in us. But when we're dependent on God and we do God things instead, mm. it's mm. like they're things that we really can't Come do. On. And yet God does them through wow. us. And that's the God dream. So if I could go back, that's what I would have told myself. Pursue the God dream and God dependency. Yeah. Pursue so, God. So you would encourage 20-year-old Tammy, girl, you are talented. You're smart. You got this. You can do what you set your mind to. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Like, you'd be like, that's awesome. I love that drive in you. But I want you to remember to do God things. Exactly. Not just do anything because you can do it, but to do God things. And we're hearing a common theme from you. To know what are the God things. To passionately pursue exactly. Jesus. Because in a world full of options, there are plenty of things you could be doing. But I want to do the God thing. Am I, am I repeating back 20-year-old yes. Tammy's wisdom? Yes, absolutely. That's great. Okay, let's continue in this vein. If you guys, because now we're getting to know 20-year-old Tammy, 20-year-old Derek, and we're hearing wisdom. If you guys could define this season of your ministry using one story, like an interaction you've had in, in, the, in the mission field. If you could define this season of your ministry using one story, what's that story? Tammy, why don't you go first, and then we'll have Derek go. What is that story? Okay. So for me, it was um, 
for that season of, we lived in a village, just to give you a little bit of context. So we live in a village and um, just no electricity, no water. I mean, we're nothing. It's just, when you think village, we're living the village life. And I thought it would be a good idea because I have so many children that I would bring some crayons and some paper to color on. I thought that was an awesome idea. And when I brought that, you know, I tried to explain, you know, there's not enough crayons for everybody. So you've got to pick one crayon. And when you're done, you put it down and then you pick another one. And everybody, except for this one cute little guy, man, he grabbed all the crayons. He wasn't going to let anybody use them. And he held them really tightly right here to his heart. So, you know, it's like, oh, now I got to try to, you know, wrestle them down and take the crayons down and try and to tell him to only take one. And while I was doing that, and I could see him, he was just holding him like this, God really told me, you know, for a season in life, just, just again, just opening my eyes and said, you know, everybody you look at in this village is like that little boy. They're looking for the treasure that they want to grab so mm. tightly to their heart and that they want that so tightly. And he goes, and, and, you know, it's just that God moment when Jesus said, I am that treasure. Mm. They're just waiting. They're waiting mm. for somebody to tell them what it is. And when they got it, like he's holding those crayons, they're going to hold the gospel of Come Jesus on. Christ to their heart. The treasure. I love that, that little guy who was like, I'm going to take all them crayons. <laughs> Nobody's getting any. That treasure. Uh. Okay, Derek, same question. For me, and, and again, you know, we're living in the middle of Bush in yeah. the middle of nowhere, uh, no, no things to depend upon in, in terms of our normal day and routine of life. It's, it's so far removed, and, I, and, I, and there's no way I can describe it for you. It's just it's a difficult way of life. And yet, the people there have been so warm and welcoming and loving and kind to us uh, that I begin to develop relationships there that are far greater and, and deeper than relationships I knew could ever exist. Uh, even as a pastor, I loved being involved in people's life. But when I land there, I find out that they want me involved in their life in ways that I didn't even know you could be involved. I mean, they want you deep in relationship with them. And one of the guys that I was closest to was the village imam. He would be the equivalent of the Islamic pastor. And I literally... Maybe for the people that don't know, you guys are working in a, like, fully... That's true. That is true. It's 100% Islamic uh, the village context, yeah. yeah. Our village of about 800, and not only ours, but if there's hundreds of villages that surround us, every one of them is exactly the same. Thank you. Uh, they see themselves as 100% Islamic. And so that's where we live, and that's where we get to be, and we think that is fantastic. Yeah. And in that place, I have struck up a friendship. The, my, my closest friend is the imam. And so I visit him. I go to him. I hang out with him all the time. Uh, I, I, language has gotten to the point where I can converse with him and, and tell him all kinds of things that I'm doing and want to do. And, and the greatest thing that I enjoy doing with him is when I'm about to leave his house, I will say, Akacha Alefe, can I pray with you? Mm. And uh, wherever we are, if we're in front of his house or if we're in the field or wherever we are, he will grab me by the arm. He pulls me to his front door, and then he says, I want you to pray right here. Come on. And he asks me to pray for him there. And this is just so powerful to me because I will pray, and I believe as I pray. I pray God, and in his language, of course, I'm praying, God bless him. Mm. God pour out your spirit yes. upon him. God bless his family. Give his animals health. Give his wife health. Help. Give his, his children health. God bless him in every conceivable way that I can muster the language to say. And then I pray all of it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Amen. And I do that every time, and he always wants me to pray with him. And so I have just seen a... Uh, 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 an opening in his life, an opportunity in his, in his life and in his heart towards the gospel. Mm. And it has been just such an amazing time in our lives to spend that time with him. Gosh, I love how deeply, <clears throat> deeply relational. It just like brings tears to my eyes about the, how deeply relational that is because that, that is how we see Jesus doing it. Like, and I... I I haven't even talked to the staff really about this. I've talked to Carly about it a couple times, but this phrase just rolling around in my heart is just spirit-filled neighborhoods. Yeah. That, that what if the pivot that God is bringing to the church is far, is way more deeply relational. It's not just sign up for our connect groups if you want to meet people, but literally the church is in every neighborhood all throughout our cities and, and every, just, just, Th those neighborhoods are full of the Holy Spirit to where it's deeply relational. It's, it's, 
it's, it's a both and, like, hey, do you want to come hang? Do you want to come to a weekend gathering? But also, hey, we're having a meal, like, Monday evening, and we're going to hear a word from our pastor. Like, do, would you like to come? After I've already, I've been done, helped him build a fence. And, like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I love what you're describing is that I'm just going to him as a man, and, I'm, and he, is, he is, we are in relationship. You said he's, like, one of your best friends? You said that? He is a very good friend, yes. That's incredible. That deep relationship that will continue to open doors to the gospel. Like, I love that you boldly just pray it. Bless him. Bless, you know, bless his family. Bless his wife. Bless his kids. Bless his animals. Bless his crops. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, amen. I remember we've been some places in, in Africa, my dad and I, and, and some, we heard some stories from some imams that converted, and every single one of them, they used this language. It felt like we could see in color for the first time. Like, one guy was telling us a story about how he would go back to the mosque to, to share from the Quran, and it, his mind would scramble until he got to the parts that mentioned Jesus. And then that's the only things he could muster the words for for, like, a whole entire month. And then he went back and talked to this guy who shared the gospel with him. He was like, what did you do to me? And he's like, that's the Holy Spirit. And he's like, I need him. And he gave, he gave his life to Jesus. And, and it was just like, and he, then they said, it was like I could see in color for the very first time. Like I love, and, and I, I, I want to ask this question too, because I love how deeply relational you guys are in that. And that you, you take people through a process because it very much costs them everything. And one of my fears as we are, um, as we're in a season where we're determining, you know, as, as the 21st century West, like what, what, what do we want to rebuild? Mm -hmm. Like what do we want our churches to look like? What do we want them to feel like? One of my fears is that in an effort to remove every barrier we can from people responding to Jesus, it's, it's been cheap. Because it's just like a hand raise and a connect card and a thing, and then I come back and it's, but, but like, Jesus is, I, I love that he ministered to the multitudes and to the crowds, and every time people showed up, he was feeding them, and he was healing them, and he was preaching to them, even when he, but then he was like, if you want to really follow me and be my disciple, uh, y'all trying to, like, eat my blood, or drink my blood and eat my flesh, or what? And they're like, nah, we're good, and they leave. And then when they come back again, he's not like, no, I'm not going to minister to you. You refuse to drink my blood and eat my flesh. No, he was moved with compassion for them. And I feel like there's, there's, a, there's a, a level of being moved with compassion for the crowds, but also that discipleship costs you everything. Like to be a disciple of Jesus will cost you everything. It will cost you uh, uh, your pride. It will cost you like insert thing here. And my fear is that, is that in, in an effort to eliminate barriers and make it easy, we've made it cheap. And, and so I love how the commitments that people are making, because you're not seeing, you know, numbers like we like to celebrate in the U.S. that are like 75 people baptized today and all that. And that's awesome. I don't want to seem like I'm taking shots of that. Baptize as many people as possible. Praise God. Go for it. Celebrate the junk out of it in Jesus' name, because that's awesome. And it's life change. But you guys, you'll see, you know, one in six months then maybe two, then one more. Kind of, if you can, help us understand what that work is like and why it's important in something you said earlier that these are all of your stories. If you've ever sown into the kingdom of God through Genesis Church, these are your stories right. as well, and this is your work as well. And so take us through that for a moment. I'll just tell you real quick a story about a, a man named Amadou because he came to us as a Wahhabi Muslim, which is the most radical sect of Islam, so much so that we were even afraid to have him among some of our other people because mm. he was so radical. Mm. Fast forward a little bit, he was hungry for God, seeking God, became a Christian, and then we began discipling him towards the day when he would be baptized. One of the questions that we ask in that process is, you know, you have to turn your back. Talk about pivoting. Mm. You have to reject everything of your former life. This is not adding to or Jesus mm. and something mm. else. This is an mm. absolute and complete turn away from everything mm. in, your, in your early life uh, because he was raised that way. And we asked Amadou, one of the last questions was, what, is, what are you going to do if you suffer persecution as a result of what you're doing right now? He mm. was standing knee deep in water ready to be baptized when we asked that question. And his answer was, 
I'm going to follow Jesus anyway. Well, Amadou went home right after that to tell his parents what he had done, that he was a follower of Christ. And his father told him, you are no longer my son. This is not your mother. These are not your brothers and sisters. This is not your house. You're not welcome here. Not only that, but his wife, and he had a one-year-old baby daughter at the time, took their daughter, and she went 13 hours away to her village. And she's still there today. Uh, Now, nearly four years later, nothing has changed in that family situation. And Amadou now lives with us in our house. Mm. And, but today he's asking the question, so now what would it look like if I was to become a pastor? And it has cost him everything. It mm. cost him his family. It cost him his wife. It cost him his daughter. It cost him his opportunities to work. He had no means of income. He had to literally live yeah. with us, and he had nothing. He walked away from everything in his entire world, his total. And, and, and to understand it, you almost have to, to have a little bit of a teaching on what it means to live in a communal society where everything revolves around the family, your hope, your future. Even his uh, old age was, was, was taken care of by those people that would be in his house. He gave up everything that he knew in his entire community mm-hmm. and social structure to follow Jesus Christ. He's only one, and we've had others, but that's just a story of Amadou, who we love dearly. <clears throat> I, w- I want to take a moment because, what again, one of my fears is that we hear that with as an American audience, saying, we go, wait a second, why, how could you possibly take someone from their, from their family, from their wife, from their kids, from their future? But I think what we, what we have to remember is that, is that those, all of those people are people that Jesus dearly loves, and he died for, and it was Jesus who is our, our rabbi, our teacher, our Lord, our friend, our savior, who told us to go into all the world and share the, the good news that the kingdom of God is here. And something you said that, that, Jesus is not just like something we add. Like I feel like for a lot of us as Americans, Jesus is something that we add into our world. That It's like, you know, I have yoga for my physical health and then I go see my therapist for my emotional health and I have Jesus for my spiritual health. And like Jesus is a life coach and not our Lord. Like it's, and he's, there's a very big difference. And so when we hear stuff like that, we're like, well, how could you possibly take all of those things? But we have to remember that the good news of the gospel is that we are all dead in our sin, and Amadou is now alive. Amen. And, and if we don't have that context, then it sounds like, oh, white guy, come in and save the day, and you just wrecked his family. That's not it. It was Jesus who told us to go into all the world and preach this gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything I have taught you to do. And it was also Jesus who said, because of me, families will be divided. Like father will turn against son and mother against daughter for my name's sake. And it wasn't because Jesus was coming like, how tight is it? I'm going to like split up families. He's like, because this costs you everything, unless the Holy Spirit opens it up inside of you, it is so counterintuitive and it makes no sense and it can seem cruel and it can seem like, who do you think you are? But we have to remember that the good news of the gospel is that Amadou was dead and now Amadou is alive. And the Holy Spirit, I'm believing, is still working in Amadou's family, in his parents, in all of that stuff. And who's to say, we saw story after story when in places we've got to visit of them being able to return later like they would go back to their village go back later and they were able to share the gospel and so we can pray I'm calling us as a church now we have a name so we have an assignment that's how that works that we have a name now and we get to lift up Amadou and we get to lift up his family and we get to pray for courage for him and steadfastness and 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 creativity in his world and in his life thank you for sharing that story of of Amadou. Okay, I want, I want to close um, with this question here, and we'll start, maybe you guys can tag team this one, but um, you kind of, I guess, maybe answered it a little bit just with that story of Amadou, but this is extremely important. What have you learned in this season? You guys have been four or five years now in this? Okay. What have you learned about the power of the gospel to transcend culture, language, ethnicity, and geography? the power of the gospel and the kingdom to transcend all of those things? What have you learned specifically in a brand new way in a, in a, in a culture that is not only unknowing but sometimes hostile to the gospel? What have you learned about the power of the gospel to transcend 
Holy Spirit, bring that word to life on the inside of us to transcend culture, language, ethnicity, geography. Um, so for women, just it is the way it is. So if you ever made the comment you live in a man's world or in the corporate world was a man's world, let me tell you, you have no idea what it means to live in a man's world. <laughs> it's just like you, you go into a different culture and there's something inside of you that right away sees injustice mm. and there's something right away that wants to like, you know, I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's going to be something, you know, <laughs> and that, and it's there, it's, it's there inside of you because the injustice is there. Yeah. Um, but what I learned in that season is that I learned that no matter where I am, it doesn't matter who I've met, who I'm going to meet, who I've never met, and who I will never meet, everybody and every person is made in the image of yes, God. Yes, and it yes, is yes, God's yes. desire to pursue them. And mm. it is God's desire to have a relationship mm. with them. And that the gospel of Jesus Christ is what brings the freedom yes. to women. Yes. It's what brings yes. the great, freedom great, to great. children. It's what yes. breaks the bondage. Come and on. when you do that, it transcends all of it. It's like, you want to be angry with you? I'm still hauling water at the river with you every single day. <laughs> you can yell at me while we're carrying water and you together. can yell at me while we're carrying water. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can wow. be, you can... You know, the injustice, because I have more than you, because, you know, it happens. I am, I am in, you know, a third world country, and, and some people might think that. And it's like, it's okay, because I'm still going to pound millet with you every day. Yes, I'm great, washing great, clothes with great. you every day. I'm rubbing shoulders with you every day. And that because I want to fight for the gospel in come your on, life, because that's truly what's going to make you free. Mm. That's truly what's going to break the bonds. That's truly what's going to raise you to reach all the potential you could possibly Right. have because the God dream is always bigger than the you mm. dream. We should just let Tammy preach today. That's what we should have done. Uh, Derek, what have you learned about the power of the gospel to transcend culture, language, ethnicity, geography? You know, you could go into another culture, you believing God has sent you, knowing God has sent you, you have the word of God in you, you have God's word with you, and it would do me really no good to go into their house, to go into their gathering and argue for the kingdom, argue mm. theology, say our God is better, you know, our, right. our Bible is better than what you have. You know, it, that would do no good. Mm. But what we can do, and this is a verse that I, that I love, and it's 1 Peter 3.15, and I'll paraphrase it greatly, <laughs> but it's basically the verse that says, live your life in such a way that men will see you mm. and ask you the reason mm. for the hope that you have within. Yes. And then give an answer uh, in decency and respect. Yeah. And we feel like that even though we live among very gracious, kind, and loving and giving people, that we want to live even higher wow. than that and even better than that and morally uh, in a way uh, that they will see us and the way that we live and the prayers that we pray and the, ex the relationship that we talk about Great. that we have with God, and they will look at us, and we don't have to argue theology. We yes. will live in such a way that they're going to say, what come is on, it in come you? On, come on, come what on. is it about you? Yes. Why is it that, and this is so awesome, but we feel like our greatest ministry that we have to offer is not the knowledge that we have in the Word of God. It's simply the ability that we have to pray. Come because when on. we see a sick person, we can pray. Come on. When we see a crying person, we can ask what's yes, wrong and we can yes. pray for them. These are people who pray five times a day out of legalism, of course, but they'll pray five times a day with no expectation that God hears them, let alone wow. would he ever answer them. Wow. And so when we pray for them and they're sick and they're able to stand up and, and walk around, they're, they're, they want to know, they yes. say, okay, there's something different about yes. you. And, and we're in a praying culture. But we pray, and God has done stuff, Come on. and they want to know. Come and on. so they're asking, what is it in you? Yes. What is it about you? And then we just yes. talk. Yes, yeah. And then all we do is share our life with them. Yes. It makes me think of when Paul is having to defend himself against the super apostles, and, and he's like, hey, you know, they can argue all they want, but like when I show up, we'll see whose life is better, because the kingdom of God is not in, in word or deed, but, but in power. So, like, all the people want to argue, like, when I just show up, we'll see, like, is there more joy in your world? Is there more peace in your world? Is there more gentleness, kindness, like, the fruits of the Spirit, which is actually, like, tells you if you're a disciple or not, not how much Bible you know. 
It says a lot of Bible, people know a lot of Bible, but their lives far more closely reflect Genesis 5, 8, or Galatians 5, uh, 18 and 19 and 20 than 21 and 22. You know, the works of the flesh and they're conceited and they're arrogant and they're rude. And so that discipleship is not just knowing the word, it's the fruits of the spirit, which is is what you're describing, like that power and that authority. I love that you're like, we're not gonna go in and like argue the gospel. Our God, is, our, our God could beat up your God. Right. <laughs> like I'm gonna go to someone who's crying and I'm gonna pray and they are gonna know the power of the Holy Spirit. They're gonna feel the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit such that they're, they're like, hey, uh, whatever you just did, like I want that thing. Like whatever that is to, to, where, to the point to where people are willing to walk away from, from family. They're willing to walk away from future. They're willing to walk away so that they can have relationship with the living God in Jesus' name. Wow, thank you. Can we, can we show some love in the room and online? I want, I want, us, to, I want us to pray for, for Derek and Tammy. Um, so if you're in the room, if you would just stretch your hands forward, if you're all in line and you feel comfortable, maybe you're in a living room, uh, maybe wherever you may be, if you feel comfortable, would you just stretch your hands toward that screen? We know the Holy Spirit is not limited by space or by time, and he can, he can move through screens and camera lenses. So, Father, we're so thankful um, for Derek and Tammy and for the response to the call of God on their life. God, I am thankful that you are continuing to open doors. You are providing. You are making new relationships. God, you are giving them new dreams new visions, creativity and ways to execute the call of God that you have placed, your call that you've placed on them in their world. God, for these 20-somethings who are, who are going to be heading over with them, these, these 10 new ones who are going to be heading over with them, God, grant them gra grace them for this season, grant them favor, protection, a, a holy fire on the inside of them, passionately burning with the power of the Holy Ghost to transform lives everywhere that they go. God, I'm thankful for political favor, favor with the leaders, favor with the imams. God, that you would continue to open doors even there as they humbly serve the people around them as extensions of the kingdom of God and ambassadors of reconciliation, as Paul tells us that we are. You Use them to reconcile people back to our Father in heaven. We love you and pray that you're glorified in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Amen, amen, amen. Maybe you're joining us online and, and you would say, Pastor, I wouldn't consider myself somebody who follows Jesus. I want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus right now in this moment. I've, maybe something as they've been talking, there's just something different. That's what it is about the Holy Spirit. There's just something that's other. It's, it, it's, we use this word transcendent. It feels so other because it is, because it's the kingdom of heaven on earth at work through us. And maybe you don't have handles for it. Maybe you can't explain it. Maybe you don't have the words, but there was something inside of you that was lighting up. My friend, that is the Holy Spirit who is drawing you to the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. And Scripture says that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouths that Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again for our sins that we will be saved. It is a free gift of grace that is available to you and to me that God didn't come to make bad people good but to bring dead people to life. And if you are looking to be brought to life on the inside, then my friend Jesus is inviting you into relationship today. So if you are in the room with us here, we would ask you to raise your hand to acknowledge, yes, I need Jesus. But since it's technology that is connecting us, there's going to be a button popping up, a digital hand raise. And we're going to ask you to be bold. If you're saying, I need Jesus today, that is me. We're going to ask you to be bold. Click that button. It's going to be a hand raise. And we believe that your life is going to change forever right now in this moment. That heaven is about to throw a party for you that the Holy Spirit is about to flood your life and start to change you from the inside out. It doesn't mean that everything is better when you walk away today, but a process called sanctification has started. And that just means that the Holy Spirit is making you into the best version of yourself. He is making you into the version that you, of yourself that you were created to be. And it starts by receiving Jesus. And so I'm just going to ask you to be bold and brave and click that button. And, and we're going to join our faith with the faith of those who are praying for the first time. Everyone in this room, I'm going to invite us into this prayer. And living rooms all across the world that are joining us, Genesis at home, would you join your faith with the faith of those praying for the first time? Or maybe the first time again, maybe this is a rededication, um, but would you join us in prayer? Say, Father, thank you 
for sending Jesus to die for me. I know that I've sinned and I need you. Come into my world. Be my leader. Be my Lord. Give me a fresh start. Make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use my life to build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen, Genesis Church and Genesis at home. Come on, can we praise God for brand new life in Jesus' name. For a prayer night next Sunday morning, Genesis at home, we love you. Peace, we out of here. Oh man, what a day it has been together, Genesis at home. We just said a prayer together um, to receive Jesus. And many of you might have said that prayer for the first time. Some of you might have said it for the first time again. And we just want you to know that we see you. We are celebrating with you and we want to connect with you. Click the button below so that our team um, can get in your world. We can mail you a gift um, and connect with you. This week, guys, we've got some pretty awesome stuff happening at Genesis. Um, This Wednesday evening from 7 to 8 p.m. is prayer night. Yes. And the great thing this week, we're so excited to tell you guys, we are going to be gathering physically in the building right here on Wednesday evening. Um, So go ahead and click the menu button in the top left corner and then click prayer night to register. Um, We have 100 spots available for prayer night. We would love to have your kiddos join us. Um, We will not have kids programming um, for prayer night, but like I said, we'd love to have kiddos join us for this evening. Um, When you do register for prayer night, just make sure to read that email in its entirety, the confirmation email you'll receive, just so you can learn how we are taking steps to keep you and your family safe in this season. If you would like prayer, if you would like to connect or get signed up for a connect group or give, um, there's buttons popping up below. Just click the button that fits your need best. You can also text us to the number 97000 at any time, and our team is standing by ready to pray for you, ready to encourage you, ready to do life with you. Well, Genesis at Home, it has been a great day. Um, Thank you for being with us. We are honored to be part of your world. We love you. We're praying for you. We will see you at prayer night this Wednesday. Bye.